Good morning. I'm Professor Marcelo Busato from the Department of Applied Linguistics at the University of Campinas, Unicamp. And this is Abralinha ao Vivo, Linguists Online. Abralinha ao Vivo, Linguists Online, is an initiative of the Brazilian Linguistics Association, Abralinha, in cooperation with the Permanent Com International Committee of Linguistics, the Latin American Association of Linguistics and Philology, the Argentinian Society of Language Studies, the International Association of Applied Linguistics, the Linguistic Society of America, the Linguistics Association of Great Britain, the European Linguistic Society, the Australian Society, the Linguistic Society, the British Association for Applied Linguistics, and the Spanish Linguistic Society. Abralinha ao Vivo presents a daily series of guest talks featuring leading Brazilian and international language studies scholars. This is an ongoing open access project designed to give students and researchers free access to state-of-the-art discussions on the most diverse topics related to the study of human languages. Today, we're proud to have Professor Frieda Sturz from Belgium with us. Professor Sturz is a full professor at the Faculty of Arts, KU Leuven University, Antwerp. She holds a PhD in general linguistics from the University of Leuven with additional academic work on formal syntax and semantics, computational linguistics, German philology, among other subjects. Currently, Professor Sturz carries out research in the fields of computer-assisted translation, terminology, and multilingual document management. She has several important publications in the fields of lexicology, translation, social linguistics, translator education, not to mention lots of software applications, um, for lexicography and natural language processing. She's also interested in various aspects of language and multilingualism in business and in society. Her research includes projects with industrial partners and public institutions. Among other important institutional roles she performs, Professor Sturz is director of the Institute for the Dutch Language, which marks, makes her responsible for the collection development and hosting of a huge amount of all kinds of digital language resources for the Dutch language. Dr. Sturr's presentation today is titled Language Technology, what's next? She will share some of her views on machine translation, transcreation and new opportunities for in the language industry and language technology research and professional practice. On behalf of Abralin, the partner institutions and our viewers, I wish to extend a warm welcome to you, Professor Sturz. We are very grateful that you could join the project. Please feel free to start your presentation when you're ready. Okay, I hope that uh, this is okay and that uh, you can hear me all. Yes. So, um, good afternoon from Belgium. Um, I hope everybody's fine wherever you are in the world. And I'm really happy that I can share some thoughts with you this afternoon on language technology. Where do we come from and where are we going? So, and I'm also open for some questions at the end of the session. Let's see if we can make this work here. Yeah. So my uh, lecture today will deal obviously with language technology starting with a bit of history from machine translation. How come that people from let's say the middle of the 20th century were so fascinated by the idea of having computers understand human language? So I'll talk about the developments of machine translation and then later on the new developments in artificial intelligence and natural language processing. And as applications, I will have a brief view on localization and the media and how they work with computational linguistics and language technology on the one hand, and then some of the lexicographical challenges all over the world where dictionaries are being created and how to handle this using computers. 
I will use some abbreviations during my presentation. And uh, first of all, CAT for computer assisted translation. M-A-H-T is machine aided human translation versus H-A-M-T, human aided machine translation. M-T obviously for machine translation, NMT for neural machine translation, the latest technology, and NLP refers to natural language processing. Basically, there was this ultimate dream uh, in uh, human uh, mankind um, to have computers understand, analyze, and produce human language in a perfect way. And this has always triggered curiosity. And this was, in fact, the ultimate dream. But we see that in the middle of the um, 20th century, especially close after the Second World War, from an American point of view, it was obviously in a climate, in an environment of the Cold War. And there was this dream to decode, especially the Russian language, Korean or Vietnamese languages, again, looking at military purposes and producing automatic translation. Instead of having military staff having to learn these languages and try then to decode it on, in a you know, manual way, people wanted to build computers and machines to understand other languages. So that was a first onset in order to study languages. Some of you may remember Enigma. Um, this was a, a very special project during World War II. But we can already go back to Descartes as a philosopher. He studied mathematics and philosophy. He already referred to the possibility of creating a computer that could understand language. And Leibniz, in his theoretical work, you can really see the onset already of computer science and understanding language from a mathematical point of view. Many of you may remember the history of Alan Turing, the mathematician, who during the Second World War was hired by the British Intelligence Service to help build a system that could decode German messages that were encrypted, that were coded, and decode that into full German text. They had to crack the code in a mathematical way using basically a machine that would calculate all the codes to come to a fully understandable German text. And this, of course, proved to be a strong weapon in the, the, the rush that was going on then to uh, win the Second World War. And looking at these experiences that were heavily inspired by military conflicts in, at later after the Second World War and in the 50s of last century, the first attempts were made to create a machine translation tool. It started immediately after World War II with a memorandum written by Warren Weaver. He wrote, again, a theory uh, from a mathem mathematician's point of view. It was called the Mathematical Theory of Communication. And this really started serious research into machine translation. And another landmark was 1954, when many of you may know the Georgetown IBM system was demonstrated. It was a first public demo at the Georgetown University in Washington, DC again of a Russian English machine translation system. Again, it was in the middle of the Cold War. They wanted to decode Russian and translate this automatically into English. However, it was not, not at all a full-fledged system. Now, it was a small-scale experiment of just some 250 words and six grammar rules. So it was basic, so to speak. But still, during those years, especially in the 50s, an enormous amount of money was made available to do research in computational linguistics into development of machine translation. However, the ultimate goal, the dream that all these researchers had in those days was FACTUT. So it's a very strange acronym and it stands for fully automatic, high quality translation of unrestricted text. Now, I've highlighted three parts of this phrase 
because the three parts in color are problematic. Fully automatic, first of all, is a dream. It hasn't come true yet. We still need human translators in pre and post editing. So this was quite unrealistic from the start. Second, the um, idea of high quality. What is high quality in translation? Is it perfect? But one professor may evaluate a translation a student made as perfect and the other might disagree. So this quality issue is quite something big and something important. And then the last element in this phrase, unrestricted text, again, is extremely unrealistic because it means that whatever type of text, whether it is um, a theater play, whether it's a technical document, whether it's a very complex legal document or it's poetry, everything should be able to be translated by a machine. And again, this will prove to be false and is highly unrealistic. So as I said, a lot of money went into the research and the National Academy of Sciences in the United States got a little bit worried in the middle of the 60s. They uh, commissioned a committee of uh, top level researchers and they had to review and to analyze the work and the research being done in automatic language processing. And the question was, is it worth it? Do we really have to spend so much money on computational linguistic research? Is there a result? Can we expect something? And the conclusion was devastating. The conclusion said, among other things, machine translation is not economically viable. It's slower, less accurate, and twice as expensive as human translation. And this meant a disaster in cutting the funds for computational linguistic research in the United St States, first of all, but also elsewhere in the world. So basically, people walked away from the idea of having computers understand human language. They said it's not realistic. Of course, what were they looking at? Human language, indeed, is the most complex paradigm to be analyzed by a computer. And they looked at sentences of this type. Spring is the first season this year. Well, human beings perfectly understand the sentence and it refers to the seasons and the rhythm of a year. You have spring versus summer and so on. The second sentence, it's a spring bed. Obviously, when we look at spring in relation to bed, human beings know that we are talking here about the quality of a mattress. And in the Alpec report, it was said a computer never ever is going to have the knowledge to decode the first spring and to disambiguate it from the second spring. Same with the other example, but this is more into the structure of the sentence. If you have the question, are the students playing football? Every human being perfectly understands the question. But what about, are the students playing football, your classmates? Again, playing football now has a completely different syntactic, places a different syntactic part in the sentence. A human being can pass this sentence. However, for a computer, it will be very, very difficult to do. So these were example sentences showing that both the computer lacks the knowledge of the world lacks the uh, capability to decode ambiguities on the level of semantics, but also lacks the ability to decode syntactic structures and all these differences language can entail. And don't forget, humans also understand sentences that are ungrammatical, sentences with mistakes, sentences that are not finished, computers can't. So these were arguments used in the Alpac report. Of course, later on in the 70s, things started to improve again and people looked at machine translation from a completely different point of view. It was no longer fully automatic, high quality of unrestricted text. No, they started with a very small scale experiment called Meteo. It was done in Canada to have bilingual weather reports because as Canada is a bilingual country, they wanted weather reports 
automatically generated in French and English at the same time. As you know, Canada is a vast country. Weather conditions can be very, very complex and dangerous. So people need to have this information. And this worked fine. So they narrowed the thing down. It was translation on a very limited word list. The uh, only the terms used in this particular field of a weather forecast and only two languages. At the same time, the European Commission started to notice that they needed to support their human translators with machine aid because it was too much. All the human translators together couldn't cope with all the work on translation in the European Commission. And Systrom was installed as a system. Systrom Systematic Translation was a company based in Luxembourg and they were quite successful in producing machine translation, but again, limited in language pairs and in particular types of documents. And then again, in 1978, Eurotrust started, European Translation, a huge research project um, that was funded by the European Commission. In the 80s, we saw commercial systems coming in, such as Logos and Metal. And from Metal, we also had the Barcelona technology from Lernout and Houseby speech products, which was quite successful. So things started moving on, but in a controlled way, in a limited way. Of course, the European Union was growing and growing, and they started a research project called Eurotra. And the idea was that they wanted to translate documents, language independent, so from Greek to French to Spanish to Dutch and vice versa. So they wanted to build a machine translation tool for the European languages that was not language dependent. So not looking at the pairs, but looking at all of these language combinations at the same time. But this is very complex because in the 80s, there were nine official languages at the EU, which already gives us 72 language combinations that you have to work through. What happened later on, the EU expanded to 23 foreign languages, but then we already have 506 language combinations. So Eurotra was a huge project with different, a lot of computational linguistic research done at particular universities in Europe, for example, at my university, KU Leuven, but also together for Dutch then with University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. It had its advantages because it created an enormous amount of research all over Europe. And let's say the computational linguistic scene got to know each other over the different countries and started doing really interesting research. Finally, it did not result in one unique machine translation tool, but a lot of insight had been gained on how computational linguistics was supposed to work and how machine translation could be realized. What is machine translation right now? Well, we have many commercially available software tools. The industry, that's a fact, uses machine translation extensively for internal use, just like a draft without quality check or combined with post editing to show it to their customers. So for external use, governments use it. It's also used by the European Union. MT is also used by translation agencies. They are called language service providers and they have a huge market. And obviously, on the internet these days, we have huge amounts of data available, which also makes machine translation easier. What do we have to understand about machine translation is that it is not a translation memory. It is not a collection. It's not like a database of things that have already been translated before, because translation memories also exist, but they have been brought together by human translators. Now, machine translation is really an engine. It uh, consists of semantic, linguistic, and terminological data. And it is using these actively, and it gets new input, sentences that have never ever been translated before, and will try to come up with an acceptable translation. It is one of the most complex of all data processing applications. And it's definitely dependent on the quality of the input. There is this saying in computational linguistics, if you put garbage in, 
in the source language, then you will, gob you will get garbage out in the target language. Whereas a human translator can still correct a mistake in the source text, the computer is not going to interpret things and cannot see whether a stupid mistake has been made in the source language. So you will also get garbage out. MT is definitely not a perfect translation system requiring no human intervention. MT is not applicable for all types of translators and still needs good translators to be around. And then again, we have to wonder about the issue of quality. What is quality to a particular customer? In some cases, a draft translation is enough. Information gisting. I want to know something new, for example, on an, a new car or an engine that is being produced in Japan. I don't speak Japanese. I can just run some machine translation on a Japanese website and I get some things in English that might do because I don't want a fully publishable text. So quality can depend on what the customer really wants. Now, why do we really need MT? Obviously, the world is shrinking. We uh, are deeply globalized and that we saw also with the Corona crisis right now. The world is one global village. We exchange a lot of information worldwide. Trade is worldwide. So we need a lot of information. If you have a new product as a, a particular company creates a new product, you need information to come with the product, you need leaflets, manuals, and so on. And you want the time to market to be as short as possible. So the time that we have to write communication, to write information is shorter and shorter. We also have a need for standardization. Homogeneity in text output, lexical usage, fixed terminology. Computers can do that perfectly well. And at the same time, MT is a very important topic for computational linguistics to create good end-to-end -end applications. And for customers in general, there is a huge gain in productivity. Let us also compare briefly, what is the advantage of a human translator versus machine translation? The human translator has some advantages, such as a human that is really a specialist in translation work can uh, come up with an accurate, stylistically sound and idiomatic text. Translators who really feel how things have to be said in the target language. If you master, for example, French in a source language and Brazilian Portuguese in a target language perfectly well, then you really know how to write an idiomatic text. Humans are also excellent in discovering and feeling differences in culture in text type and in target group. Do I make a translation for a highly educated scientific audience or do I make a translation for, let's say, a lay person, somebody who has only basic knowledge of a topic? And in theory, humans can translate almost any kind of text. The disadvantages of human translator is that they are slow. They can only work a limited number of hours a day Good translators are very hard to find, people with an excellent knowledge of different languages. And consistency in translation work is hard to maintain, especially if you have a huge project with large teams. If, let's say, 10,000 pages need to be translated within a week, then it's difficult to have everybody on the same level of consistency. Now, let's have a look at machine translation. On the other hand, what are the disadvantages of machine translation. Well, machine translation is weak in everything I mentioned before, highly idiomatic texts and so on. They're not useful for all type of texts and it also often depends on the data format if you can use machine translation easily. And as I already said, it is highly dependent on the quality of the input. Garbage in means garbage out and the machine will not correct mistakes in the source language text. However, the positive points are that machine translation will excel in terms of terminology, in speed, consistency, and availability. It can work 24 hours a day. 
It doesn't have weekends to take into account. Uh, it doesn't have a hangover or a Monday morning blues. It's always there. And it definitely shortens the time to market and reduce the cost. What does the client want? That is the most crucial question. Which translation method a company is going to use depends on the client's needs, the purpose of the text, and the budget. And this will always be an evaluation uh, that has to be made in a particular setting. And again, what does the quality has to be? What does the client really want? Does he have to have a perfect text that is a perfect communication for its customers, or is it just information gisting? Is it a draft he needs? So let's go over the degree of automation. You can look at in translation, I mean, you have human translation, the traditional way. We also have the concept of machine-aided human translation. This means the human translator still is in charge, is the boss, but the machine will give support with terminology lists, with all kinds of tools. The other way around, we have human and machine translation. Here, the machine will do the translation with the translation engine, but the human translator will help with pre and post editing. And then we have fully automatic translation. And this is the end, the end of the, the, the scope, let's say, where the human being is not intervening anymore, and which is very, very rare if this ever happens. So we can have a look at the levels of technological tools to support translators and to, uh, to use in language technology. Starting in the left-hand column, you see the human translator who is in charge, but who can use obviously a word processor. He can even uh, opt for controlled language in the source language, which means the language is limited in semantic choices and in syntax. So you get more straightforward sentences easier to translate. You can use, the human translator can obviously use spelling and grammar checkers, can use a lot of e-dictionaries, can even create own terminology dictionaries, and can use the internet for term mining. The human translator can also move one step further and is going to, can buy some computer-assisted tools, uh, sorry, computer-assisted translation tools, like term extraction tool, term recognition tool, concordancing index. He can also invest in a terminology management system. The human translator or the translation agency can invest in translation memories. So you get a database of sentences that have already been produced. And the, um, the translation agency or the human translator can also specialize in localization adaptation of web pages for different countries and so on. Also in this field, we have localization software and translation tools that are really addressing how to translate a web page. It's quite interesting. This is a whole different story and I'm not going to talk about that in detail, but also these are very interesting. And then at the very right end, in the right column, we have the machine translation tools where they have an engine that really does the work. And then the human translator is either pre or post editor. We also have hybrid tools. Systrom created one of those where you have a machine translation engine and you combine it with a translation memory. So it's already translated text from the human translator. So of course, then the output can be richer and better. When we look at the computational linguistic research on machine translation systems, then we see that we uh, have three different generations of MT systems. The first types that have been created in the 70s and 80s were definitely rule-based systems. The second type is statistical, and the latest, the most modern type is neural machine translation. Let's go into that in a little bit more detail. Rule-based machine translation is what we call the traditional approach. So basically, what the computational linguists in those days, so let's say it was the 70s and 80s especially, wanted to do was they were going to create all the tools using linguistic information from the source language and the target language. 
and a lot of dictionaries and grammars had to be built in order to make this happen. So basically, the approach in those days was as if um, a human translator was working. A human translator has a native tongue and studies a foreign language. And then with all the knowledge in the head of the human translator and the dictionaries and grammars that he stored, that he studied, he is going to translate. And they tried to build this in a machine translation tool. So this obviously is very, very intensive in development because if you put sentences in the source language into the machine, the rule-based machine translation will generate output sentences in a target language and using all the morphological, syntactic and semantic data, analyzing every bit and piece of the input sentence and creating a target sentence. So this of course requests a huge amount of linguistic information. There are three different types of rule-based machine translation, direct systems, it's like dictionary mapping, with basic rules, the transfer systems where you really have morphological and syntactical analysis and then transferring this to the target language and you have interlingual systems where there is a kind of abstract interlingua in between, a kind of Esperanto, so to speak. Um, the um, transfer system is the most well-known in rule-based machine translation. And as, as I already said, it's a very intensive development task. A lot of material is needed, both for the source and the target language. You need a morphological analyzer, a parser, grammars, the lexicon. You have source mapping, domain modeling, and you need a lot of dictionaries. So it's very intense. We have had some very successful products, however, such as for Siemens, the German company, they built the metal system, that mechanical uh, translation and this was first done for German to English and English to German so it was a very defined construction two languages and only for technical documentation for their own company so also let's say the dictionary was limited to this particular domain the Siemens technology metal then came to Belgium and was used to build a Dutch French French Dutch translation tool to be used by the Ministry of Internal Affairs because Belgium is a bilingual country and everything had to be translated from Dutch to French, from French to Dutch. Again, if you limit yourself to one language pair, then of course, if you have all the dictionaries and all the analyze, analysis material available, then this works. And it was successful. It also worked for our government to use this machine translation tool for Dutch, French, French, Dutch. Advantages of uh, this rule-based uh, system is that you have, you need not, not no uh, text material, no bilingual texts are required. So basically you can build such a system for any type of language, even if there has never been a translation, imagine that we have no translation whatsoever from Brazilian Portuguese to Finnish, no problem. If you have the Brazilian Portuguese dictionaries and grammar analysis, and you have the Finnish one, you can build a system. You don't need any texts in common, no digitized data whatsoever. It only needs the investment to build the dictionaries and to do the morphological analysis. It also is domain independent. The rules are written in such a way that it will work for almost every type of text. And the quality can always improve because every error can be corrected with a target rule. You have total control and I can really assure it's true because I worked with my students in the 80s and the 90s testing rule-based machine translation. And we saw some very strange mistakes popping up sometimes in a translation something you said, a human translator would never make this mistake. This is really something the machine does. But then we knew what was the problem and you could correct the rule. And so it is, every error could be corrected. So that is the advantage. For example, we clearly saw in the 90s that the Cistron system 
for French-Spanish language combination was used intensively at the European Commission, and the translators used it a lot. And each time when they came across a very strange mistake in the output in Spanish, they indicated, they marked the mistake and gave feedback to Sistram so they could correct their system and it went better and better up to 99% correctness. So this is great. It's good. You could see it as a learning system, so to speak. It's also interesting to see that rule-based systems are reusable. If you have a strong source language analysis, for example, you've done English and you have source language analogies, well, then it can be shared with other languages. So you can go easier on building a new language pair. And the example that I want to refer to here is again for Cistron machine translation. They had a strong uh, analyst, uh, analysis of the French language already. They also had a strong analysis of the English language in their portfolio. So the Dutch and Flemish government decided to invest in building a better environment for Dutch French and Dutch English and vice versa. And it worked perfectly well. So the reusability of what had already been developed for French and English worked fine. And so Dutch could be developed uh, in the same way. Disadvantages of rule-based machine translation systems is obviously that we don't have enough good dictionaries. And if you have to start building all the material for a language that hasn't been researched yet, then it is very, very expensive to do so. Sometimes it's hard to deal with ambiguities, idiomatic expressions, even if you can correct the system. And many rules are needed to deal with all kinds of linguistic information. So it is a huge effort to prepare to have all these materials in place. And that's why later on, starting in the 90s and then further developing into the 21st century, statistical machine translation came into being because then translations were generated on the basis of statistical models. But therefore, you need bilingual text corpora. The first ideas were old. They were already introduced by Warren Weaver in, his, in one of his famous documents in, at the end of the, let's say, just after the Second World War. But it was then abandoned because and in those days, there was not enough material available. And it was reintroduced in the late 80s and the early 90s. And obviously, this helped a lot in having an effect as there was a new interest in machine translation in recent years, because now things were completely different. Statistical machine translation does not look at all like rule-based machine translation. On the contrary, it all is about the probability of translation. It is about how likely is it that sentence A in French is going to be translated in sentence B in English. It is just probability and statistics. And this could only happen because since the 90s, we have big data on the internet and we have a lot of bilingual material available. Advantages, obviously, is that uh, you can use all the data that are available. There are many, many corpora, text corpora, in machine readable format, both parallel, already being translated. For example, for the European Court of Justice, everything is available in French and English. For Belgium, the whole legislation is available in machine readable format in Dutch and French. You have an, a huge amount of parallel corpora. The same for Canada, a bilingual country. And there are also monolingual data that can be found on the internet. So, the interesting thing is basically a statistical machine translation system is very stupid. It has no knowledge of language whatsoever. There is no grammatical knowledge required. They're not tailored to any specific pair of languages. They just use data and they compare and they calculate the probability rate of finding a good translation. 
Again, the problems here are if you have a lesser resourced language, and I will come back to that later on. In other words, if a language is not prominent on the internet, if you don't have much data, then SMT will not work well. For example, if we want to translate from, let's say, from Dutch, which is good resourced in digital data, to Swahili, which is very poorly resourced on the internet, we have a problem. Corpus creation for a particular language can be costly. And it has also been seen that for statistical machine translation, sometimes if you have languages with completely different word order, it can be really problematic. And then one step further is the use of an artificial neural network, so the so-called neural MT. And this is, again, predicting the likelihood of a sequence of words. But this time, the machine starts thinking itself. It builds a network and it uh, starts learning from this network. So here, the key word is deep learning. It's a machine learning method because there are multiple layers in the network. And the machine indeed starts investigating finds a particular sequence of words and then controls the likelihood and builds on that. So the moment that some of the providers start using neural MT and put a layer of neural MT on, on the normal statistical MT, it was significantly better. So neural machine translation now is hot and is gradually bridging the gap between human and machine translation, but it is not perfect yet. And there are a lot of publications, the academic world and the large tech companies, they are in a race to improve accuracy and output quality of neural machine translation. So it's a very hot issue these days. Let's have a look at the big five, as they are called. And this is not the game in South Africa, not the big five animals, but it's Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, and Microsoft. All of them are heavily involved in neural machine translation. For example, in November 16, Google announced the Google Neural Machine Translation tool. And immediately everybody noticed that Google Translate was getting better. Still, I don't recommend Google Translate on the contrary, but it was, there was an improvement. You could notice it clearly. And then obviously neural machine translation got rolled out for many, many languages in the Google Translate apps. The same Microsoft and Systrom, they also launched neural machine translation systems and Amazon also used Amazon Translate. You can localize then content for international customers. So you see it's big business and the large companies that are really, really working hard on this. Of course, they are always going further and further in developing the architecture in a better way. And also you can see that with all the research being done, it's getting better and better. Long sentences can still be a problem because uh, it deals with vectors with a fixed length. And therefore, sometimes if sentences are really long, things can really go wrong and we don't not, we don't fully understand why it happens. Sometimes neural machine looks perfect in the output translation and then all of a sudden you get very, very strange repetitions or very, very strange interjections in a sentence. Yeah, so limits on the length of input sentences and this can result in bad translation for very long sequences. But again, as I said, People are doing so much research in this field. It is getting better and better all the time. I would like to refer to DeepL here. Some of you may have heard about it. DeepL.com, you can have a look at their website. This is a very reliable neural machine translation tool, and it's more accurate and nuanced than Google Translate. The interesting here, you have language combinations from English into Chinese, Dutch, French, German, Italian, Japanese, Polish, Portuguese, Russian, and Spanish. And um, they use, uh, in fact, pivots with English in between. So it's a very, very interesting system. And again, it is improving all the time. I've seen some commercial companies using DeepL for some of their translation work. 
but the highly confidential work they will keep to themselves and have human translators do the job. This year, DeepL won the Webby Award for technical achievement. So it might be worth to look into this if you're interested. I would also like to share some of the quality issues uh, relating to machine translation linguistic tasks. So we need a uh, customer specific dictionary building. So if you have a company um, that works in the building and construction area, then it is wise to have the text material of that company uh, analyzed, uh, decoded, you do terminology research and you enter all the data. If you can pre-edit your source text, obviously, then the quality will be much better and you will not get that many mistakes that are multiplied during the translation process. And then again, we can post edit the MT output to get a perfect copy. And we can also validate the content to check whether it is really correct what has been rendered in the target language. Linguistic pre-editing is very important. One hour pre-editing saves three hours of post-editing and can uh, obviously make sentences grammatically correct. Sometimes, as I said, mistakes occur in the source language. Also, pre-editing can uh, include spelling check, punctuation check, clarifying sentence structure and ambiguities, can also protect parts of text from translation. You don't want proper names to be translated into something strange. And we can even arrive at controlled language, as I said, where the linguistic strings are limited in length and you get a more simplified language. Post-editing, there we can choose, there is a whole scope from very light post-editing to the full process of post-editing. If you just look at the draft output of machine translation without human intervention, then you have a draft quality. You can go through the text and see if it's important, if it's interesting, but it is not a text that can be published as such. If you do content validation, then you can you check the text and then you see, is the content fully understandable? If there is a really completely not understandable sentence, then you correct it and that's it. It's called machine translation with a guarantee. It's kind of intermediate level. And then the full post editing means that the text will be checked after machine translation has come, has created the text and that a human a post editor will turn the text into something that is stylistically very nice with the same quality as a human translator could do it. And that is ready for publication. So there's this whole, let's say, scope of from light to full post editing and the choice is the choice of the customer. Now I briefly, for the end of my lecture, I would like to um, highlight a couple of interesting applications looking at language technology. The first one is localizing media content. The second, and in relation to that, I will talk about the case of Netflix. And then finally, I will end my uh, talk with something about lexicography in the 21st century, big data and artificial intelligence. Localizing media content. Perhaps many of you are watching television and some of you live in a country where um, texts or television series are dubbed uh, or they are subtitled, it doesn't matter, but you always have a form of translation, yeah? So, Straight translation is sufficient for technical documents and sharing basic information, but in many cases you need one step ahead and you have to go to localization. Localization means that you adapt original content to a new target audience. This requires more work and more finesse than translation. You adapt, for example, the measurement system from um, the uh, imperial system, the British system, to a more European system. You add or you change some words to help a local reader and so on. You adapt it to their cultural format. And one step even further into this is transcreation, where then you rewrite into another language, but you can even change the message yourself if this is needed to adapt to cultural differences. What is funny for, let's say, 
uh, a Spanish citizen, and which is a good marketing joke for Spanish market, can be totally unacceptable in another part of the world. So there you adapt to cultural differences. I have huge material on this, but this is not part of this lecture. Now let's think about when you look at your television, you are looking at a film or a series, or you look Netflix, then sometimes you have subtitling as translation and subtitling mm -hmm. can be intralingual and interlingual. This means an English film can be subtitled in Dutch or French for a foreign audience, that's interlingual, but it can also be done intralingual. That means we subtitle an English film with English subtitles for people that are deaf or hard of hearing. Second type of translation is dubbing. Dubbing is a form of translation, but then we replace the language, the original spoken language, the original um, audio track is replaced and we record with professional voice actors. So to get uh, another language uh, that we hear. And this is very common. I'm not sure about Brazil, but it is common in uh, let's say in France, in Spain, in Italy, in Germany, and so on. Voice over, you also know that this is done very often uh, for nature, documentaries, and so on. Voice over is almost narrative in nature. And then you have audio description, and this adds to the soundtrack all kinds of elements, visual details that cannot be understood from the main soundtrack alone. And this is typically done for people who are blind or who have low vision. They hear, but they can't see what's happening on the screen. So audio description gives them more information. This is a very interesting topic again for research, but now I want to stick to localization and then go to Netflix. So as I said, localization is the process of adapting a product's translation to a specific country or region. So you can even localize between the German spoken in Germany and the German spoken in Austria. Or you can localize between the French spoken in France and the French used in Canada. It is a huge process. It's much more than translation. It is also called cultural adaptation and linguistic adaptation. It also relates to the translation of software. Video games, a lot of video games come from Japan, but they have to be translated and localized, sometimes even symbols have to change because some of the Japanese symbols are completely un understandable for people in Europe or in South America. Websites, video, everything can be localized for different parts of the world. Now, have you ever looked at Netflix and were you never worried about what you heard actually in the video and in the soundtrack and what you saw in the subtitles, well, I was really shocked sometimes because very often you get very strange subtitles and I said, but this is not what they were saying. How is it possible? Well, there is a very special thing. Of course, Netflix is a streaming service that goes for the whole world and you have so many languages and they want to have their series up to date and available immediately in all kinds of languages. So this is a very intense process. So mainly they will work from English to other languages. However, some of their brilliant series are Scandinavian. The original language is Finnish, Swedish, Icelandic, Norwegian. We also have Dutch series, Spanish series, Italian, French, and so on. So if you want to do subtitling here, this is a very intensive process if you want to do this manually. Again, because it's very unpredictable, in this series you have colloquial language, idiomatic language, and also the use of slang. Think about the police series. And Netflix uses two NLP disciplines, yeah, natural language processing disciplines, sentence simplification and machine translation. So what do they do first? There is a very well-known uh, algorithm in NLP that is called sentence simplification. If you do that, if you, from the script, you make simpler source sentences, 
then already you get more fluent translation and it is less difficult to do the post editing later on. So what do they do is they use original source sentences, translate them into English and translate them back. The back translations are already simplified. And then, uh, as I said, Netflix will use NLP and artificial intelligence for three reasons. Uh, deep learning for high quality machine translation. They try to do as much with machine translation as possible. They also want to predict the language demand for each title. And they want to uh, do the understanding of the cust uh, customer's complaints. They use deep learning to understand all the complaints better. Yeah, so in fact, yeah, traduttore, traditore, uh, he is um, sometimes the translator is not uh, really that reliable here. And it means that the translated content is fundamentally simpler than the original source content. So back translations are simpler. So, and that's why they use this simplification model. Something else I want to like to uh, explain, but then I'm going to end my lecture, is that there is a huge difference in the languages that we look into, into, for example, the media. We have high resourced languages and low resourced languages. This means that they have some languages have a huge amount of data and have parsers and taggers and all kinds of computational linguistics tools available. Obviously, English is one of them. I would like to refer you to metanet.eu, where you have white papers on the EU languages and the digital resources. For example, Dutch, my own language, is quite well resourced. But this is not true for every language. And when we don't have enough digital resources, then it gets more difficult to make things available in those languages. Second, I want to refer you to our website, CIPL, which uh, also deals with endangered languages. And languages can also die in a digital way if they are not properly resourced. I'm going to skip my part on artificial intelligence research because otherwise the lecture will take too long, but you can uh, have a look at the slides later on. So I just briefly explain here what artificial intelligence and natural language processing are dealing with. Some of the applications you can find text mining, keyword spotting, uh, sentiment analysis. To end with the, the things I'm working on today, and that is the challenges in modern lexicography. In my institute in Leiden, in the Netherlands, we built all the large dictionaries for Dutch. The Woordenboek der Nederlandse Taal, the dictionary of the Dutch language, took more than 100 years and many scholars to be completed. Nowadays, everything is available in digital format. The question we are confronted with as researchers is how to create new dictionaries and how to keep them updated. And this is a very, very big research question. So for all academic dictionaries worldwide, the challenges are there. What is the role of dictionaries in society, in science, in knowledge economy? What is the scalability? How can we improve our production process? It cannot be done manually anymore. We have to find ways in using NLP and artificial intelligence. And again, we now build huge databases with all the lexicographical elements. How can we customize this for diverse audiences? In other words, can we create learner's dictionaries? Can we create dictionaries for um, young people, for children? Can we create dictionaries for specific target groups? So this is one of the challenges many people are uh, dealing with in our field. And we are now working on an interdisciplinary approach. Linguistics will cooperate with data analytics, with artificial intelligence, with citizen science, and will use elements of human computer interaction in order to find new ways to create dictionaries. So new targets, new uh, tools can be created using the material we have in our databases, such as writing aids, language learning software, computer assisted translation tools, and all kinds of language applications used in robotics, in household equipment, and so on. So all these elements can become useful in society. 
But that means that languages need to be highly resourced. If you don't have any digital data for, let's say, a regional language in uh, somewhere in South America, then the language applications will not be there in robotics, in all kinds of equipment, in learning software and so on. So this is really a huge challenge that all the languages should be digitally supported. I come to my conclusion. Language technology is a very fascinating and interdisciplinary domain. There are lots of challenges and new paths for research. And the output of our research has a huge impact on society. The language industry, by the way, is the fastest growing economic sector. So this is something to think about. Well, I'm at the end of my lecture. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm ready to answer some questions. Thank you so much, Professor Sturz. Fascinating um, speech. I learned a lot. Uh, I wish to convey some questions from the audience, and I have one or two questions uh, for myself, too, if you don't mind. Uh, we have a viewer, Paulo Gauto, and his death. And he's asking if uh, what perspectives are there for machine translation and sign languages? particularly Brazilian sign language, Libras? Yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you for that question. Um, sign languages are, um, at the moment, they are very hot in research. So uh, on my, at my own faculty, we um, created a university program for uh, Dutch sign language and for translation work in that. Many research projects are going on at this moment. And we now just wrote a research proposal called Sign On, uh, together with partners all over Europe, to have machine translation in place for sign language. It is brand new. I can't say nothing much about it yet, but a lot of things are under development. We also had a beautiful project, and perhaps the person who asked the question can uh, check um, Trinity College Dublin, uh, the Institute for the Deaf with Lorraine Leeson. She is the researcher in charge there. And there was a beautiful project called Just Designs, where they developed an app that you can use on your smartphone. If, for example, a deaf person is confronted with uh, an unpleasant situation in, in the street or whatever, or he has to go to a police office or to the judge, and where you have then the triangle between the interpreter, the deaf person, and the police, the police officer or the judge. It's a wonderful app. So I can highly recommend that um, the person checks this project. It's called Justice Signs from Trinity College, uh, Dublin. Thank you so much. Apparently, Paul was on the chat room and he's very happy with your reply. Thank you. Okay. That's very good. Uh, I have a question of myself here. It's more like a situation I wish you could maybe you want to comment on. I, the other day, we, we had a company translate uh, our, the names of our courses at Unicampi on an international website, Portuguese English translation. And um, all course coordinators were checking that. And then the people from the math department, for some reason, they decided to run the translations on Google Translate. And they were very concerned that the human translations that we, we got from a company were exactly the same as Google Translate. And of course, the first thing you think is, well, they just ran it through the machine and they're charging us. Uh, uh, as, as if they uh, hired a human translators. But I was thinking to myself, what if this domain is so well resourced that just Google just got it right, right? So, uh, yeah. so the question to you is, could you elaborate on that? Is there gonna be like a moment where we won't be able to tell whether the translation was human made or, or machine made? And what kind of implications does it have for translators? Yeah, um, there might come a moment when uh, in a particular domain, in restricted domains with very big resources, 
you might not be able to see the difference. It's like with the chess computer. Remember the first computer that played chess against the, the chess champion in the world. In the beginning, the he computer blew. lost. And in the end, it got better and better. So for some domains, indeed, uh, machine translation will get excellent, excellent quality. But at the moment, Google Translate is not up to this. Um, and again, it will all depend also on how resource, how digital, how many digital resources does the language have. In, in one of my books, I refer, for example, to the Ebola crisis. Uh, we are now have this pan pandemic crisis with Corona, but with Ebola, people learned a lot because um, the um, uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, so Doctors Without Borders, they uh, help these countries first by sending out messages in English. But Ebola was uh, in three countries where overall there were 90, so 90 languages, African indigenous languages, people being illiterate, languages that were only there in spoken format, and people didn't understand. So you need to have the possibility to translate for that. And so at the moment, this is still very problematic. By the way, translating uh, names of courses is very complex. It's uh, very, very complex. It's not an easy um, uh, matter because we were doing this year, we are comparing websites also from uh, uh, the different Dutch universities. And what you see there, they have then the information in Dutch and in English uh, for foreign students but the translations are really, really very, very complex. I can hardly believe that at this moment, Google Translate can do a perfect job with that. Thank you. Um, another question from Anne Tem. Um, how do you assess the efficiency of reversing and reusing dictionaries of lesser known language pairs to create new dictionaries? For instance, uh, by Dutch as hub, to cre as hub create Greek, Portuguese or Estonian Portuguese? Yeah, it is, um, it is delicate to, to use the reverse system to build a new dictionary is a very complex thing to do. It is not something, if you have the software, it's not like if you have um, a dictionary from one language A to language B, that you can just reverse it automatically. It needs a huge check and you need to rebuild the dictionary using other corpora. That's also why, for example, a French German dictionary is um, uh, thicker than the German French dictionary or vice versa. I mean, I don't know by heart, but it all has to do with the morphology and the complexity of a language. So you cannot just turn it around and we make a reverse dictionary then. Right. Well, I think I'll have one last question. Uh, this is my question again. Uh, this is about uh, neural networks and deep learning in translation. Um, computer uh, scientists and uh, even the data scientists are concerned with the black box, what they call black box models, right? Yeah. And uh, and now you have situations, you just mentioned a situation where a deaf person might, might need to talk to a police officer and use an application for that. Um, we have situations in airports. So there are risky situations where translation can really make uh, damage if it's not uh, uh, well done, right? And on the other hand, there is this, uh, in many cases, black box models are more efficient. So there is like a trade-off there between efficiency and reliability or, you know, or, or care or precaution. Uh, that's uh, interesting, right? On the other hand, black box models, because they're not prejudiced, let's say, they might be uh, learning something about natural language that would be useful for us to, to understand, but they're not interpretable. So overall, could you elaborate on this? Uh, how, how much, uh, how worth is it for us to work with black box models if you have to weigh the risks against the, the profits, let's say? Yeah. That's a very good question. Um, on the one hand, we know that um, neural machine translation, for example, can um, really um, come up with great results. And sometimes we're really surprised about the result. And then all of a sudden, something goes wrong. So they can translate a number of paragraphs in an excellent way. And then all of a sudden, they start repeating a sentence as if it's nonsense or so, and we don't know why. 
So this is, it is a danger. So what we see at this moment, for example, um, I refer to a Belgian bank, they work with six languages and they use DeepL um, to translate some of their texts, which are, let's say, routine texts. And um, they, are, are, they are within a particular domain and they are controllable. However, if it is confidential information, if it is uh, sensitive information, they use humans and they don't want to work in the cloud. They just uh, work with a very restricted format. So again, another example is in, um, in the Netherlands, in Leiden, where, where I work, there we have um, um, translation bureau, Medilingua, and they are specialized in the most difficult medical texts possible. So some texts could be translated by a machine, but the highly specific and you know, sensitive documentation is done by specialists. So the world is changing there. And on the one hand, if you want to use a neural machine with a black box, you, you have to evaluate, is it worth it? Uh, is this a good way for me to do whatever I'm doing? What type of texts am I working on? And so on. It also means that the profile of the translator is changing. We still need a lot of translators, but we need them to specialize in particular domains. Some translators will become pre or post editors. Some will do other jobs. But again, like a huge company like Hogarth, they do transcreation. They have 3,000 people working for them. They do translation work, but on a totally different level with cultural information and adaptation. So there is a lot of things to do in the translation field, but obviously it is changing. That's definitely true. All right, thank you so much, Professor Sturz. We are uh, getting to the end of the live. Um, I, want, I wish to thank you once again. I wish to, to thank the viewers, the public for the questions and for, we have lots of uh, expressions of appreciation for your talk here on the chat room. So thank you for that. Uh, I wish to remind all of the viewers of the importance of joining Abralin, becoming a member of Abralin, um, so that the linguistics community, the area of linguistics in Brazil can be strengthened. Um, uh, and basically, just thank you again, Professor Sturz, for, uh, for, for the conference. We would like to hear your final words now, if you please. Well, thank you all for listening to me and uh, for being so patient. Uh, it was a pleasure to um, present this talk and obviously we could talk for hours about some fascinating details in linguistics uh, and language technology but um, i also appreciate the initiative taken by abralin and i hope that in uh, hopefully not a very far future but a rather near future we can meet back in vivo um, alive again uh, in, in conferences and I hope to see you all at the linguistics conference um, that CIPL will organize, the international conference that will be held in 2023 in Kazan in Russia. That's all for me. Thank you very much. Thank you.